Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we're talking player props for the 2020 NFL season, assuming it happens, with J.J. Zacharyson. He is the editor-in-chief of Number Fire and FanDuel, breaking down his player projections and where he sees value right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at the Power rank.com ed how you doing today i'm doing good i'm doing well uh excited to be on with you again man yeah i mean and uh, it's it's weird to talk about 2020 nfl because are we gonna yep. have a season like i i don't know it's so hard to tell how things are gonna break down but like it's yeah. we're just in a weird 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 time man yeah and i think uh, you know, the true answer is that nobody knows. Nobody yeah. knows what's going to happen. Um, you know, so a lot of these projections say that we're going to get at the peak of this thing within the next two weeks. Um, so, and it's interesting because obviously, like, if w- w- the deaths keep increasing and they keep piling up and basically everyone says that number is going to keep increasing over the next two weeks. So you're just going to get these dire headlines. But the reality is, if we do get the peak of this thing in the next two weeks, we're probably in pretty decent shape. Yeah. Uh, that's not to say that it's not going to come back this fall or this winter or whenever that may happen. Uh, but hopefully this country is in a better capacity to test and, and do other things. Um, yeah. So, you know, from my perspective, I think there's just a ton of uncertainty uh, around everything. But, I mean, there's really nothing we can know with certainty. And the, and the people that should be the most honest about that are the ones that make the models yeah. uh, for, for how this is going to go. Um, but you know, I mean, I kind of feel like we'll have some kind of NFL. I don't know if we'll have 16 games. I think I'm more worried on the college level where, you know, for example, the university of Michigan has already canceled all on campus activities for the summer. For the summer. For the summer. Wow. I did not see that. That is. So yeah, you know, and I think, you know, maybe that's premature given the statement that I just previously said that no one knows anything. And I think everyone inherently. Uh, underestimates the uncertainty in all of this. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess I would say I'm I'm a little more optimistic about NFL, a little less about college. And I mean, I, I mean, the ramifications for college, I mean, that I mean, it, it might financially yeah. decimate college sports as we know it. Yeah. And so, like, obviously, that's all secondary. Like, we don't I feel like we don't need to say course. that. Like, it's obviously all right. secondary, but like that would like still suck. <laughs> Like, yep. it's obviously secondary to, like, lies and stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, it would still not be fun to not have college football on Saturdays. And yeah. I'd like to avoid well, that situation. I mean, I think, you know, the I think University of Michigan will survive. I think yeah. the Power Five conferences will survive. But sure. I don't really know about athletic departments everywhere else, right? Right. And so not only is college football going to look a lot different, but, you know, the NCAA tournament is potentially going to look a lot different if – athletic departments are just closing down across the country, right? Right. Because of the lack of football revenue. So a lot of ripple effects. So basically be smart. Let's get rid of this stuff now. So we don't have to deal with that later. Um, It's, uh, it's definitely wild. The name of the podcast is covering the spread. Obviously we know nothing though. Like, it sounds like it's related to someone tweeted that at us actually like last week. Like it sounds like it's a coronavirus podcast. Uh, Covering the spread has nothing to do with that. It's the well, spread I, thought, of the game. I mean, he, he tweeted something to the effect of, uh, you know, first time listeners aren't going to know or are going to think that this is a COVID podcast. And I yeah. thought that was in reference to my somewhat long winded story about um, my family and my experience with this whole thing. Um, but, you know, it could be about the, the title, too. I, I, I think it was the title. Even, I had not even thought about that until you mentioned it. So I had a friend who knows nothing about sports um, message me be like, yo. <laughs> Is this like what is because I I don't think they pay attention to my Twitter feed, um, which they shouldn't. No one should. Uh, right. But I think they were confused about it too. So no, we're just talking about betting. Uh, but I, I understand why that'd be a little bit confusing. So hopefully, hopefully we can get back to actual <laughs> spreads soon. Um, yeah, <laughs> we can have real sports to talk about soon, so that the title can make more sense. But uh, we'll see. You know, we're getting there. Uh, people are hopefully being smart about all this stuff. So we can get back to sports as soon as possible. On a much brighter note, we got JJ. Zach Reeson coming up today. JJ has been on this podcast twice, and he has obliterated it both times because 
back last summer, uh, he talked about how he thought Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb were good bets to lead the league in rushing yardage. They were first and second, respectively. For the Super Bowl, we had him on talk about Pat Mahomes at 20-1 to 1 to score the first touchdown. Pat Mahomes scored the first touchdown. So J.J. has a, a – he set a pretty high bar here, Ed, and it's a lot to live up to given those two previous episodes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're going to have J.J. on to talk those player props here at Vandal Sportsbook. We're going to go through his projections process again and talk about all that. Uh, J.J., of course – is the editor in chief of Number Fire and FanDuel. Find him on Twitter at Late Round QB and check out the Late Round podcast as well. Earlier here on covering the spread, we did have Danny Kelly on of the Ringer. He was previewing the NFL draft from a betting perspective. The NFL draft later this month. I'll be talking about the NFL draft during uh, covering the future later today as well. But do you want to hear what Danny had to say? Also, Kevin Cole about free agency and. Uh, John Sheeran about horse racing. Make sure you check out Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the Google Play Store, wherever you find it, you can find us uh, to get those previous episodes. Today's podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Racing. FanDuel is doing its part to continue to bring sports fans excitement by offering users the chance to bet on horse racing. Use your existing FanDuel DFS login credentials to gain access to tutorials to learn more about the sport, including understanding how the odds work, the various types of bets, and most importantly, how to win your bets. Watch all the races live across over 300 tracks and fill the void left in your sports fandom today. For more details, visit uh, racing.fanduel.com or download the FanDuel app today eligibility restrictions apply. Let's get JJ on the podcast now to break down his favorite player props, which have now been posted over at FanDuel Sportsbook and see if he can keep this sterling record going. Covering the present. Let's bring JJ Zach Reason back into covering the spread. JJ, you set the bar pretty high for yourself, so I don't know if you want to lower expectations somehow or something, but how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm ready for this to be my regression episode. Yes, exactly. We, we deal a lot with regression. Usually it's not discussing the analysts, though. So uh, we got to set the expectations realistically uh, and try to try to proceed as if you don't have the scorching hot record here on covering the spread. We'll try to ignore that for at least a bit and not put too much pressure on you. But how have things been going for you uh, with all the, the wackiness throughout sports recently? Yeah, I mean, I too miss sports uh, as much as you guys do for sure. Um, so I'm just trying to get through. I'm just, I'm really, really, really hoping that that things uh, look good once football season rolls around. Uh, so I'm trying to think as optimistically as I can. That's the hope because uh, if we can get that, I will be extremely happy. But it's hard to know where we're going to be in two days, much less two weeks, so <laughs> and two months. So we will we'll see for sure. Now, JJ, last time we had you on, I guess the first time we had you on, actually, last summer, we went through your process for building projections. And that was after the draft. So we'll talk about the intricacies of making projections before the draft later on. But for people who have, may have missed that episode discussing your process – uh, what's the broad outline for you for building out projections for the NFL? Yeah, so I think the best way to think of it is that I go with a top-down approach. And what I mean by that is I'm, I'm looking at team-level projections first. Uh, and then from there, those are sort of the baseline numbers of what we're looking at, team touchdowns, etc. And then you're sort of divvying out uh, how things will, will, will look. Um, so I'm building out the team level numbers like pass to rush ratio, plays run per game, because obviously volume is a really big deal whenever you're projecting things. Um, and then from there, uh, and, and those those things, I'm really looking at uh, recent history, doing regression analysis, and I'm looking at coordinator data. Those are the three probably big buckets that I'm looking at with the team level stuff. Uh, but then once that team level, uh, once those team level numbers are sort of set, you can then build out the individual players. Um, by assigning target share and rushing share to get volume. Uh, then you're looking at sort of league-wide and individual player efficiency to get their per target numbers or per rush numbers. Um, then you sort of just build it out from from there. And then, um, you know, I, I sort of separate uh, quarterback from running back, tight end, and, and wide receiver just because I want the running back, wide receiver, and tight end numbers to build up into the quarterback numbers. So, um, you know, there's a lot of projections, and they're good projections, but there's a lot of systems that – don't necessarily, uh, you know, b basically the, the total passing yardage for a team that I have projected is what is going into uh, th those those three positions from a receiving perspective as opposed to doing it all individually. So it's a top-down approach, doing team-level stuff, and then digging into the individual players. 
So JJ, you mentioned that you look at the coordinators. How much have you found does that matter for the team level numbers? Yeah, people will. There's a lot of causality issues uh, where you're you're saying that you know there's a narrative a while ago that Kyle Shanahan feeds his ex receivers, but when you really dig into the data, he had Andre Johnson for a while, then he had Julio Jones for a while. Uh, so, so there's a reason why those guys were seeing all this volume. It's because they're really good at football. Um, but there are some stuff that I, I think that the, the, the thing that you really should focus on more, uh, there's, there's pretty decent correlation between or by how these coordinators are running their offense from a pass to run split standpoint. And obviously pass to run splits can be influenced by game script. So I look a lot at neutral game script ratios as opposed to overall ratios. Um, some I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, but Kevin Stefanski is a good, a good example where, you know, Minnesota uh, ranked bottom three in an overall ratio last year and passed a rush attempt ratio. They were 23rd in neutral script ratio. Stefanski, you know, comes in at the end of the, of Minnesota's uh, 2018 season, they become more run heavy. There's a lot of evidence that Kevin Stefanski leans more run heavy than he does pass heavy. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm going to go to the extreme and say Kevin Stefanski's the most run heavy coordinator in the league. It's just that if you're comparing to what the Browns had last year, let's say, you're probably going to look at their projection and, and bump them down in terms of pass to rush attempt ratio. Absolutely. Uh, have you found anything like with pace on that end as well? Or is that something that wholly depends on like the team composition, whereas a coordinator may not have a philosophy to go with like a faster pace and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, there's some pace uh, stuff involved. I, I would say that there are some coordinators. I mean, like obviously when Chip Kelly was in the league, it was right. a, a completely different beast than than what you typically see. But I, I also think, you know, in the end, the the delta, the difference between, let's say, like a 90th percentile pace team to the 10th percentile pace team isn't overly significant. It's sure. significant, but it's significant at the end of the season. But when you're projecting that, you know, you're going to you're going to uh, really conform to sort of a median there. So right. um, it's important and it's something that I'm looking at. But I would say that the bigger idea is to look at uh, the run, the, the pass run splits and see how the offense is going to kind of unfold that way. And the good thing, too, is that pass run splits do inform pace a lot of the way, too. So I think that, yeah, that exactly. does help account for that exactly. as well. Now, we talked about overall projections, but this is a bit of a different episode because we're recording this before the draft, and you're building your projections before the draft, maybe trying to bet some player props before the draft, too, but there's a lot of unknown. Uh, for some teams, uh, like the Chargers, the Patriots, we have no idea who will be the quarterback for those teams, and quarterback play is going to play a role in influencing efficiency. That influences a lot of things. So how do you account for that when doing these projections, when there are unknowns, specifically at quarterback, which is kind of the key position for projections? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. You know, you have to have an open mind to variance. Some teams in some situations are just going to be easier to project than others. I mean, we have a very, very large sample size of Julio Jones playing with Matt Ryan, right? We we generally know what Matt Ryan and Julio Jones are going to do this year as long as they're healthy. Um, but let's just, you know, if you look at the Chargers, a lot's up in the air. We know generally how that target share is probably going to be split up regardless of who's at quarterback. And I know it sounds like that's a broad generalization, but, you know, even if you're off on Keenan Allen's target share by two to four percentage points, it's not the end of the world from a projection standpoint. Um, and you can you, you can generally see how things are going to are going to look. Uh, I do think that um, you have to be cognizant of the fact that, uh, you know, a new quarterback uh, in, in uh, for the Chargers, not being Phillip Rivers, might influence the way that they target the running back position, let's say, because historically, you know, Phillip Rivers was targeting the running back at a very high rate, even when you adjust for that personnel. Uh, basically, every single year, the Chargers that, that Phillip Rivers has been with the Chargers, they've ranked in the top 14 in running back target share, which tells you that he probably has something to do with it, despite the fact that the running backs were pretty good in that offense. Um, but, you know, I think that the one thing to always keep in mind is if you're building these projections out and you're struggling a little bit with sort of defining that variance and seeing you know, what this, what, what the outcomes for a team like the Chargers or a team like the Patriots is going to look like sports books are too. They don't, they don't know uh, exactly how this is going to play out either. And as long as you're doing your research, you know, you can still beat those sports books um, by, by uh, having a, a sound process and looking at it objectively. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, obviously quarterback is one position in flux with a couple of teams. Uh, I think every team is in flux in terms of, you know, they're going to get contributions from the NFL draft. How do you factor that in? Yeah, so I think that the best way to sort of communicate how I how I uh, 
adjust for what's about to happen in the draft is just by going through an example. Um, you know, if you look at the Dolphins right now, the Dolphins have a really bad running back depth chart. You know, they have basically no one that can carry the load. Ryan Fitzpatrick led that team in rushing yards last year. All of a sudden, they have Jordan Howard, uh, who steps in. Um, and, and, you know, if you if you were to project Jordan Howard with the current depth chart on that team, uh, Jordan Howard's numbers would look really, really good. But you can look at Jordan Howard as a player. You know, he's relatively replaceable, uh, especially, under you know, given what his function is. He's more of an early down back rather than a, a, a pass catching back. And he hasn't had a target share in an offense since his rookie year where his target share was a little bit of, uh, above 7%. So uh, you're basically looking at a, a running back in Jordan Howard who's likely going to be more of an early down back, not going to catch a lot of passes. Um, and then the Dolphins have a ton of draft equity as well. So when you're when you're sort of divvying up the attempt share and the receiving share and the target share for these players and for a running back in particular, um, you're sort of going with the assumption implying probability and that the Dolphins have holes at running back. They have a lot of draft capital to spend. And Jordan Howard historically has done X, Y, and Z as a player. Um, and so when I'm projecting, I can't just say Jordan Howard is going to see 75% of the Dolphins overall attempts and he's going to have this 15% target share because there's no one else in that offense. I'm still looking at it uh, and saying the Dolphins are likely going to bring in a back and if they don't, I can be wrong. That's fine. Sure. I'm just playing probability here. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm doing that because I don't want to be overconfident or overstate a player's line before the NFL draft happens. Right. And it's especially true for when we're trying to bet these things because uh, you don't want to be overconfident in Jordan Howard, bet all this player props as a result of that. So it's a good situation uh, to flesh out there and a good example to use. But there are also going to be some surprises. And I think that surprises are the key, if we're talking about this from a betting perspective, trying to identify situations that are going to change in the NFL draft. Uh, are there any situations you're focusing on right now where the outlook will change and be very different after the draft than it is now and could provide us with some inefficient lines uh, as far as player props go? Yeah, the one thing to always keep in mind with anything anything sports related, really, is that we always think that we know more than we actually yeah. do, period. Uh, I mean, you look at last year with the Chiefs in particular, everyone was saying they're going to use a high, high round pick to get a running back, and then they wait until the sixth round and they get Darwin Thompson, right? Um, so always go into the draft with that in mind that you don't know how these teams are thinking exactly. And then the other thing to always keep in mind is that the biggest impact from a projection standpoint that a single player at a single position is going to make is at the running back position. Like you can even look at trades that went down uh, over the last month where, or, or signings where we see Melvin Gordon sign or get signed with the, the Broncos that impacts Philip Lindsay's projection dramatically. Whereas you see Deandre Hopkins get traded to the, to the Cardinals Yes, it'll hurt the overall volume for Larry Fitzgerald and Christian Kirk, but that gets dispersed a lot more evenly than what we're going to see in a backfield with a running back. So really what I'm looking at here in terms of things changing drastically pre and post draft is at the running back position. And then if you want to look at current team depth charts and the amount of draft capital that these teams have to see if they're going to spend at the at, the, at that position and spend a high, uh, a high pick at the running back position, you, should, you can go in that route. Um, but I think that what's more important in terms of betting and in terms of sort of surveying the markets is, is seeing where there could be teams where uh, the books are a little bit overconfident in who the starters are. Uh, and a good example of that is Atlanta. So Todd Gurley goes to Atlanta, but it's only a one year deal. Uh, and Todd Gurley has bad knees. And there's a lot of there's a lot of variance with what's going on with Todd Gurley right now to the point where it wouldn't be shocking if Atlanta spends a second or third round pick, a day two pick on someone like Cam Akers, let's say. Um, and if they do that, then all of a sudden Todd Gurley has real competition in that backfield to at least push him a little bit. And maybe Todd Gurley doesn't see as much volume as we initially think heading into the draft. And then you know, Buffalo is another example. Uh, Devin Singletary had an amazing rookie season. He outperformed what I thought he was going to do. Um, and, and Devin Singletary looks like he can be someone who is going to be really effective uh, moving forward. But at the same time, you look at their depth chart, they don't have anyone behind Devin Singletary. So if they go and they draft a running back, there's just that added chance that that running back splits that backfield more than we think. And then on top of that, you know, you can sort of read the news, read between the lines and see how teams might be thinking. Two of the sort of uh, dark horse teams at the running back position that I've been talking about throughout the offseason to spend a higher-ish pick on a running back that have established running backs or so-called established running backs in their team are Pittsburgh and Detroit. 
Uh, Pittsburgh, though, doesn't really have the draft capital to be able to spend on one. So maybe they trade up or maybe they do spend their their uh, rare early round pick on a running back. Um, but James Conner is going to be a free agent next year and, and he's been injured and they might not trust him as much. And then with carry on Johnson, uh, you know, if I were running the Lions, I would love to feed carry on Johnson. But, you know, he's been hurt his first two seasons. Uh, we've seen them split that backfield with Johnson uh, and they don't really have that much depth behind him either. So I'm really looking at these depth charts. I'm sort of reading between the lines. and I'm kind of going from there. Excellent. Uh, let's look at some of the quarterback props on FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, they're both uh, props for yardage, touchdowns, interceptions. Do any of these stand out to you as having value? Yeah, so I have two uh, at the quarterback position for for passing yards and the lines there. I think the Carson Wentz line is a little bit low. Uh, they have him at 38, 49 and a half. Uh, he played a full 16 games last year, which is a big reason that he got over to that point last season. Um, but he also played with very, very few good pass catchers. Uh, you know, they should have healthier weapons this year over the course of his entire career. And you can just look at this from a, a very basic math standpoint. Over the course of his entire career, he's averaged 253 yards per game across 15 games. So not even 16 games. That gives you 50 yards short of of this mark. He's basically at 3,800 yards with with his career yards per game average. So if he does play a full season, He's basically a lock to get to this point. Um, but I understand that's a big if because in two of his four seasons, he hasn't played a full year. But but considering that he could still play 15 games and get to that mark, that's why I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by by this Carson Wentz line. And I think that makes sense, too, to like try to find places where you have a little bit of wiggle room uh, to do that. So uh, you, said, you said you had two. Is there another one that stood out to you at quarterback? I do. It might hurt you a little bit, Jim, but I think, Baker, I think Baker's line is a little bit oh, high. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> And it goes back to what I was talking about with, with Kevin Stefanski earlier. Uh, he became really, really run, or the Vikings offense became really, really run heavy when he took over in 2018. And then uh, last year, which was his first year as offense coordinator, Minnesota ranked 23rd in the NFL and passed a rush attempt ratio in neutral game scripts. Uh, they were third lowest in, in overall uh, game script, which is because they were a good football team. So they were leading in games a little bit more. But if you look at what the Browns are doing, they're really building that offense similarly to how the Vikings had that offense where you have two good wide receivers. You got Jarvis Landry, OBJ. They add Austin Hooper to have that that Irv Smith uh, Kyle Rudolph look with just better tight ends, I would say. Uh, and then they're, they're, they're beefing up the offensive line too, uh, with some free agency moves. And then you have the, the two headed monster of Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb in the backfield. Um, and, and if you look at, at, uh, Baker's numbers last year, I would agree that to, to anyone who was arguing that they played a, a really tough schedule, that, that Baker's numbers weren't as bad as they probably looked. Um, but I'm worried that, you know, given the Stefanski hire, the way that he generally wants to run an offense uh, and the fact that, you know, Baker was pretty careless with the football last year. And we know how coaches generally look at that kind of thing. I just think that they might be a little bit more balanced than we'd like to see for Baker to hit that number. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed JJ here because it'll clearly be his last time <laughs> on covering the spread with the Baker slander that will never be allowed. But Jack Conklin, very much more known for his run blocking than pass yep. blocking. So your, your logic is sound, but we don't listen to logic when it comes to Baker. So, uh, <laughs> Hopefully he had a good run. Um, rather than when we go to the running backs here at FanDuel Sportsbook, they don't offer just rushing yardage. They do total yardage. It's receiving plus uh, rushing at FanDuel Sportsbook. How does that change things for you from a betting perspective, knowing we have kind of two avenues for players to rack up yardage when it's the, the rushing plus receiving rather than just the rushing here? Yeah, when thinking about this, I think that you can make the argument that it rewards uh, the better who's sort of putting in the work a little bit more just because there are two inputs instead of one. But then I took a step back, and it's not like when we're looking at game lines or looking at other other props that we're not looking at multiple inputs sure. to begin with. You know, we're looking at, like I already talked about, we're looking at coordinator tendencies, we're looking at personnel. You know, there are a lot of things that go into a final answer. So I think in the end, because of that, it probably doesn't change the way that I look at these bets all that much. Um, but you know, obviously if you get one of those things, if one of those things are off in some way within your model, then it can really screw you. But at the same time, you know, the books are having the same issue. You know, if, if they're overstating or understating a, a running backs rushing or receiving total, then that's something that you can also exploit. Excellent. So finally, let's talk about the wide receiver and tight end position. Uh, there are a couple of player props up right now on some of those totals. Anything that stands out to you? Yeah, I've been wanting to rant about this for like 
uh, a month now. Uh, <laughs> there's there's one that just is so clear to me is way too high, and it's Zach Ertz's receiving yards total. It, it's at nine nine hundred and twenty four and a half yards. Um, I know that I mentioned Carson Wentz as someone who who should hit his over in passing yards, um, but again, Zach Ertz isn't his only we- weapon there, uh, and that's actually key. Uh, over the last two years. Ertz has seen his target totals really skyrocket compared to the first five years of his career. Over from from year one through five, he never topped 112 targets, um, but he's gotten 156 and 135 over his last two years. So he's seen a very large difference in, in overall targets and target share. You can look at his target share where he's seen at least 22 percent of the Eagles' targets in both seasons. Uh, but the Eagles over the last two years have seen so many wide receiver injuries and and just haven't had many weapons for Carson Wentz to throw to. And we've seen this impact Zach Ertz's target share very, very directly. Two years ago, when Golden Tate uh, uh, joined the Eagles, Zach Ertz's overall target share dropped by 3.5%. Uh, when Golden Tate was playing uh, a lot of snaps in that offense, more than, more than half the snaps, uh, Zach Ertz's target share was below 20%. And then last year, without Alshon Jeffrey in the offense, we saw a 3.5% target share, again, difference for Zach Ertz. So we're looking at a scenario that 3.5% is a, a pretty significant chunk uh, uh, in an offense and for, and for a player. Um, so really, you know, you're, you're looking at a scenario where we know factually that Zach Ertz has been impacted by his teammates and by better teammates and better pass catchers. Um, and I think that alone, you know, if you have healthy pass catchers, it's going to impact Zach Ertz in some way. Um, so I have Ertz right now with 116 targets this year. That's 19 fewer than what he had in 2019. A lot of that has to do with the fact that I'm projecting a healthier squad and maybe they beef it up a little bit in the draft as well. Um, and, and like I said, he's been influenced by competition. Uh, he had 19, 916 yards on those targets last year in 15 games which is actually lower than his current line of 924 and a half. And then he's also only hit that total once in his entire career. Uh, he's played a full season uh, once in the last five years as well. So we can't even assume that he's going to play a 16 game schedule. Um, so I really, you know, and then the other thing too, you know, Zach Ertz is older. He's going to be 30 years in November, 30 years old in November. Uh, Dallas Goddard is going to be another, uh, another year in the league. And he's shown a lot of promise. Um, I just don't like this number at all. I actually have Zach Ertz uh, yardage projection about 100 yards lower than what this is. Wow. And that's really interesting because, like, <laughs> you assume that a lot of these props are going to be optimistic because, I mean, or they're going to assume that they're – or try to account for health. And yeah. it seems like the Zach Ertz one is assuming he plays all 16 games, which given the NFL and how violent of a sport it is, it seems – pretty it seems pretty out there at least to to assume that he's going to play 16 games and have the same type of volume he's had in the years past yeah let, let alone zach Ertz, who never plays 16 games right you know it, like we're not even talking about someone who consistently has been on the field and hasn't missed time zach Ertz has missed time and it's a tight you know the tight end position in general is one that gets hurt at a pretty high rate too so you know i think it just all comes together and, and it just seems like a very very optimistic uh line for someone like Ertz. Trying to get all the Philly betters to to back the overs on Zach Ertz. I see it. Yes. I, I understand it for sure. That is JJ Zacharies. And make sure you find all of his work on numberfire.com, also on Twitter at Late Round QB and the Late Round Podcast as well. JJ, want to thank you for swinging by and talking player props with us. Uh, hopefully, this one goes just as well as the past two. Again, we will never talk to you again because of the Baker stuff. We do appreciate it regardless. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Covering the future. One final big thank you to JJ Zacharyson for swinging by and breaking down uh, his player projection model and what he likes at the player props over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And Ed, I think that the Zach Ertz one was super interesting just because, like, it's so hard to project injuries. But when you find one where there's yeah. an outlier like that, it's pretty, it's, it seems like a rare situation. But the injury stuff is, is really interesting to me because it's so hard to predict how things are going to play out from that perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd be really interested to know, you know, love to get John Sheeran and pick his brain about injury modeling and stuff like that. Uh, whether how quantitative they're getting with it or whether they're, you know, making their best guess, which is what we have to do and letting the markets figure out where that number really should be. Um, you know, because if, 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 if injuries weren't considered that well, you know, I mean, it, it suggests, Oh, maybe you could just bet the under on every a lot under. of these. Yeah. Every under. And potentially be profitable just because we know how widespread injuries are. Um, obviously, that's not the smart thing to do. You'd want to be 
Uh, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that, you know, past injuries predict future injuries. That You know, it is a predictive statistic. I don't remember if that was baseball or, or whatnot. Um, but I think maybe the next step of uh, looking at these player prop level could be just, you know, a probability for injury or, you know, right. a distribution of games played for, for every player. And I'm sure analytics around that exist somewhere, uh, but I'm sure, you know, you could input age, past injury, stuff like that, and potentially get in position as well uh, and, and get data on that for sure. But I think it's yeah. also injuries represent the big split uh, when using projections for fantasy versus using them for betting because for fantasy, right. if Zach Ertz get hurt, gets hurt, you, you can use a replacement level player in his spot. In right. betting, when you're betting on him specifically, you don't get that replacement level thing. So it right. also, the injuries represent the big divide between fantasy and betting. And I think that that's something to keep in mind. Like if you're trying to make the transition from fantasy football to betting player props, keep in mind that the you need to account for that when comparing your projections to what sports books say, because there is a really big divide. And I think that it's uh, important to keep that in mind. Let's move now into covering the future for today. Ed, what do you have on deck uh, for today's covering the future? Yeah, so I wanted to talk about some calculations I've done. Uh, I took the win totals at FanDuel Sportsbook. I uh, took them on Monday, and then I backed out NFL rankings. Um, so these are my pre-draft rankings, and they account for two things. Um, they account for the price for a team to go over and under their projected win total, because that obviously matters in how the market is viewing that team. And then it also accounts for schedule. Uh, you have to know who who you're playing in order to get <clears throat> to uh, an expected rating. And essentially what the number does is it kind of fiddles with the number, uh, the rating for all 32 teams until it gets something that minimizes uh, an error uh, in terms of the win totals. So it'll know exactly how often given a rating, uh, you know, like the New England Patriots will go over nine wins. So, um, so these are my pre, uh, these are my uh, NFL pre-draft rankings. And um, so the, the results, uh, each team has a rating. And again, this is the same system where uh, the difference in the rating of two teams would give you a projected uh, point spread on a neutral site. So the, these current ratings say if Kansas City played San Francisco in the Super Bowl again, that Kansas City would be a 2.4 point favorite. Um, it's interesting, you know, you could actually use this to project what the spreads in week one should be, uh, or at least the spreads that are consistent with the market win totals. Um, we don't have the week one schedule yet uh, due to this whole, uh, actually, I don't think they usually come out by now. They usually come out around now. Yeah. Um, so that was an interesting thing. We asked JJ a lot about, you know, how he had to change things because it's pre-draft. I had to change a bunch of things too in my code just because like I didn't have the week by week schedule, which is what my code from the past year used. I just, I had to figure that out. I had to change that. Um, but the schedule is included because we know what teams are going to play, who, what other teams, right? We don't know which games are going to be played overseas, like in the London and Mexico city games, but, but otherwise we're, we're onto that. Um, so when you when you do the numbers, uh, you do get four primary Super Bowl contenders, Kansas City, Baltimore, San Francisco, New Orleans. There's quite a drop off to the rest of the NFL. Uh, I don't think anyone's really going to disagree with those four teams, uh, all teams that have good quarterback situations. Uh, another team that has a good quarterback situation probably is Tampa Bay uh, with the signing of Tom Brady. But they are not in Super Bowl contention, at least according to these, these numbers. They end up 10th. And um, that's actually even lower than Tom Brady's old team. So New England is at seventh. Um, that does seem to be quite a gap, but it's only really uh, the teams are pretty bunched in there. So, um, you know, if New England played Tampa Bay in the Super Bowl, they would be about a half point favorite, according to my metrics. Obviously, there's still a lot of things that we don't know about what's going to happen in New England. I'm endlessly fascinated that Jared Stidham is minus 350 to be the starting quarterback week one. Uh, that seems really, really high to me. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of things that could happen between now and then. Um, so uh, if you look at the results, it, it does kind of look like teams are getting ranked according to a uh, number of wins. And that's roughly the case. Um, but that's not always the case, right? So both Miami and the New York Giants uh, are projected to win six games. But the market rankings like the Giants better. Uh, so there's two reasons, again, that I mentioned at the beginning of the show, you know, the, the Giants are shaded to go over those six wins a little bit more than Miami. Okay, so it's minus 115 
um, for the Giants versus minus 105 for Miami. And then um, and then also it's the strength of schedule as well, right? So six wins is going to be more in the NFC East, uh, where these numbers actually have Philly and Dallas both in the top six uh, compared to the AFC East, uh, with New England down a little bit, uh, Buffalo the next team at ninth. So... Anyways, these are numbers um, that you can get if you sign up for my free email newsletter over at thepowerrank.com. Were there any teams that, without giving away what's in the email newsletter, were there any teams that really surprised you with where they came out in your initial run at these things? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jim, I'll tell you about whatever. We we don't need to keep (laughs) secrets on this show, man. We're in the trust tree. Yeah, you know, Indy at 15th. Okay. uh, You know, the markets didn't seem too impressed with uh, bringing in Phillip Rivers at quarterback. I don't know if it's that or, you know, I've never really liked the Indy defense. Um, I think starting at the beginning of last year, I, I, I just did not think that was a unit that could support a Super Bowl contender. Um, but they're they 15th. Uh, also, Houston at 23rd seemed a little bit low to me. Um, you know, I think that there's probably a lot of the same pieces they had last year with obviously the, the absence of uh, with Hopkins uh, with yeah. them trading them away. Uh, still seems kind of low for a team that has won their division in the last two years uh, to be kind of that far below. I mean, I mean, it's only a little bit more than a point below NFL average. Maybe that's where they'll drop off to. But that seemed, uh, you know, they seem like above average NFL team, you know, like in the, ten, you know, 8 to 12 range. Uh, maybe a little bit lower without Hopkins, but that seemed a little low. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think that it reflects, because we're pulling from betting markets, it reflects the public's, uh, skepticism around uh, the way that Bill O'Brien has proceeded, for sure. Uh, and I think right. that a lot of times that skepticism is warranted, and it's yeah. there for a reason. So um, that's really yeah. interesting, for sure. And also, uh, I mean, you know, you want to take a guess at the worst team in the NFL? Uh, Washington. Yeah, actually, Jacksonville. Jacks? Okay, you know, that makes sense. Uh, because, I mean, Gardner Minshew is fun. I like watching Gardner Minshew. I like consuming Gardner Minshew content. I am very skeptical <laughs> if Gardner Minshew is a good NFL quarterback. So and I the think that, agree that with makes you. sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, you think about the fact that, you know, how good their defense was two years ago. Right. Uh, that got them all the way to the, the AFC championship game. But now with no Jalen Ramsey and, and changes. Yeah. Uh, markets are really down on the Jaguars. And I think that's fully justified. And I think they're a fascinating team with a draft, too, because, like, they could – Maybe they do take a quarterback at nine. I think that's kind of the one of the bigger questions I have when I'm looking at the draft, and they're kind of a wild card there. So let's stick with the draft here and talk about my cover in the future because on FanDuel Sportsbook, you can bet on what a couple of teams do in the draft. And the team I think is most interesting from that perspective is the Jets because their plan is very clear, and I like clarity when it comes to betting. And I think that the Jets are most likely going to draft either an offensive lineman or a wide receiver because – If you look at the individual players at FanDuel Sportsbook, the seven most likely players for them to draft are all one of those two positions. They are three receivers and four offensive linemen. The problem with predicting the Jets draft pick is that that they pick 11, and we don't know who's going to be there, especially in what shapes it to be a pretty unpredictable draft because the linemen are pretty tightly bunched, and they're all part of one tier, and it's hard to know which of the wide receivers the Jets prefer as they might have their pick of the litter at that position. So it makes it tough to have a lot of confidence about betting the Jets to draft any one individual player. But you can also bet by position group. And both receiver and lineman are at plus money right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. The Jets taking a lineman is plus 110, and it's plus 115 on them taking a wide receiver. And I think... There is some value in both, you could argue, uh, those numbers, given that it seems unlikely that they go elsewhere. But I think it's interesting, at least, that you get plus money on both those. Because the Jets need to see what they have in Sam Darnold. It is year three. Like we talked about Danny Kelly, he has looked a lot like Jameis Winston, and not in the positive sense through his first two years. And it's hard to evaluate Sam Darnold with the supporting cast he has right now. So... I'm honestly okay. Like, if you have a strong lean towards wide receiver, cool, bet that. But my preference is betting the Jets draft a lineman at plus 110. There are a couple reasons for that. The first one is I think tackle is a much bigger need for them right now than wide receiver. They did sign a bunch of offensive linemen in free agency, but most of those guys were interior players, you know, centers or guards. 
Right now, the starting tackles of the New York Jets are George Fant, who was a former sixth man for a Seattle Seahawks offensive line that was not great, better than perception, but not great, and Chuma Adoga, who was, a I believe, a third-round pick last year and started about eight games, six on the right side, uh, I think it was, or five on the right side, three on the left, didn't look great. That's not what you want if you're trying to evaluate your quarterback. At receiver, they've got Jamison Crowder, Brashad Perriman, maybe Quincy and Unua if he's healthy. And the, the, the cupboard's not stocked, that receiver, but it's not barren either. The second reason is that you can address wide receiver in the second and the third rounds of this draft. They have two third round picks, uh, the 48th overall pick in the second round. ESPN's Todd McShay has his tiers posted uh, for different positions, and he had six offensive linemen in his first four tiers, which is pretty similar to the number of wide receivers. But in the fifth tier, which is where the Jets would be dabbling with their second round pick, there were zero tackles compared to three wide receivers. So if they want a starting caliber left tackle, and they should, they need to do so in the first round, whereas the urgency at wide receiver is a bit lower. So I don't know which specific lineman they will take because that depends on who is there. Essentially, it depends on who is there. But I think betting the Jets to draft an offensive lineman in general at plus 110 is pretty intriguing, and I am on board with that. Ed, I want to ask you a more general question. Um, Let's say you are a team like the Jets and you're trying to evaluate Sam Darnold. Would you rather beef up the offensive line or rather go with a wide receiver in that scenario if you're trying to build up your team to evaluate your quarterback? Yeah, that's tough. I mean, I, I would kind of tentatively say uh, wide receiver, uh, mm-hmm. just because some of the work that the PFF guys have done have shown that, you know, like sack rate is more of a quarterback statistic than than necessarily an offensive line. I mean, clearly you want to have a good offensive line. That's, that's right. going to help as well. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of my best analytics-based answer. Um, but... That's not necessarily the right answer. Sure. You know? <laughs> so um, I thought your analysis was interesting. I mean, what do you think about like betting both on an offensive lineman and a wide receiver and just hoping they don't take anything else? Yeah, I, th- I thought about that. Um, and I think that like it depends on what you're trying to get. Um, if you're trying to get a small profit, because like limits on, you know, betting these types of things are pretty low. So if you're trying to earn like 20 bucks, cool. Uh, but like I think – if you want to go for more of a larger payoff, I would skew towards just the offensive line. But I think, like, if you can find a book that has higher caps and has a similar prop, uh, a similar prop available, then I'd be okay betting both. Right. I also like was thinking about just betting several of the offensive linemen individually and going that route because. I think the odds that Tristan Wirfs is there are pretty low. Um, right. You could kind of weed him out or, you know, try to work it that way. But I, I, it was something I at least considered. I guess I would phrase it that way. Sure. Uh, but it's interesting. Um, I think the Jets are are my favorite one to bet just because I have a very good read on, like, which way they're going to go. It's one of those two, and that's really helpful. But it's still going to be a pretty wild draft. Let's finish up here with Quarantine Corner for this week. Ed, uh, what are you doing to occupy yourself in these times where we're just kind of cooped up inside? Yeah, I mean, I've been hanging out with my family, been reading some books. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna throw out another book out here. Okay. And this is pretty different from the ones that I mentioned before. Uh, Ready Player One uh, is, you know, not my favorite movie. Uh, but the book is really, really fantastic. Uh, I picked it up on my way to Costa Rica just because I wanted to have something to read about a year and a half ago. And it was kind of, I don't, I don't even remember why I picked it up. Uh, I'm not particularly into eighties, uh, eighties pop culture or video games, which is essentially what the book is about. Uh, there's, there's this guy, Wade Watts that he goes on this journey, um, to, uh, to get this prize. Uh, so there's, there's this big video game, and uh, it's it's a virtual reality game that everyone hangs out in called the Oasis. And uh, the real world is a, a mess, uh, you know, like our own world. And so everyone hangs out in the Oasis, which is this virtual reality world. And then, you know, the owner of the Oasis dies and he, he puts his Easter egg out there. So whoever solves this puzzle uh, gets the prize. So that's that's the, the basis of the story. Um, it's a great read. It's just it's just entertaining. Uh, just keeps you strung along the entire way. Nothing too deep. Um, so just just something fun. And uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend that 
for for anyone looking for a good quick fun read i think it's reassuring you said you didn't like the movie because i saw like i got so many like targeted ads to that movie and oh really it, it never i never felt a desire to watch it um right. so hearing that you didn't like it uh but still like the book a lot i think is encouraging there because the movie just it didn't look good at all it was weird yeah I mean, I think visually the, the movie looked pretty cool, but yeah. there's a lot of things that uh, the author had. Well, there's a lot of things they had to do to make the movie, right? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. The Ernest Klein, the author, he wrote the book because he was frustrated as a screenwriter. He got his first movie made and Hollywood changed everything and he was very frustrated with the final product. So his he thought, I'm going to write a book because I have full control over the product. Right. I can do whatever I want. I can talk about all this 80s pop culture that I love, and I can do basically whatever I want. And so it was a huge surprise to him when Steven Spielberg was like, hey, let's make this movie. <laughs> because in order to make the movie, now you got to change things and do things that look good on the screen. Right. And really, like, the best part of the book is compl- you just can't do it on the screen. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work. Right. Um, I think it's the beginning of part three, but um, yeah, I mean, the book is, you know, 98% better, my 98% of the time better than the movie, uh, yeah. and this is one of them. Well, I think that discussion is interesting, too, because, like, uh, they're talking about with Game of Thrones, how, like, George R. R. Martin, like, tried to make it so that it couldn't be adapted, and then it got adapted, and it was made right. to be, like, one of the, the biggest TV shows of all time, so I think well, that's I mean, I think- uh, really interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I haven't seen the series or read the books, but I think there's a lot of people that are just huge fans of the book. And I think he has actually said, like, I love writing the book because I can just make these huge changes right. with the stroke of a pen that a television studio would cost him, like, hundreds of millions of dollars to do. Correct. Right? And so that's why he likes the creative freedom of the written word. Yeah. I've been reading the books for... I, I go through it very slowly because I read it when I'm on the exercise bike. Uh, so, like, it's, right. it's taken me a long time to get through them, but um, I like them quite a bit. And my goal is to finish re- re- or finish reading them for the first time before I rewatch the series. Uh, and I did like the right. series. The last season is whatever, you know, I think most of the criticisms right. of it are correct. Uh, but I, I think I, I want to get through them because the books are really good. And I, I understand why people are drawn towards them. Well, well what's my, better? Uh... I don't know, because it's tough, because I think if you read the books first, you have a lot of mental freedom to, I guess, draw things out in your mind, and that's going to make the book be better than the movie almost always, because like that's a better experience, at least to me, is to have that, that freedom. But here I did see the show first, and I saw, saw the entirety of the show before I read any of the book, so... I think with Thrones, though, it's interesting because I don't know if I'd actually enjoy it as much as I am if I didn't know, like, what the characters look like and stuff. So it's it's a weird mm. thing to me because, like, I think I actually enjoy the books more having seen the show, but that's so counter to what I would have expected going in. So it's weird. I, it's hard to figure out, and I think I like them both kind of equally as of right now. I don't know if that's a cop-out or not, but it's fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, how – visual versus written medium are yeah. affect people um i mean i'm a huge fan of of books uh yeah. not that i don't like watching movies or whatnot but right uh it's, i just i just like asking that question in general yeah yeah it's tough it's t- it's a tough question uh but i think it's i should probably finish more of the books first uh but like i'm in the third one right now so like I've gotten far enough, and I think that, like I said, I think my experience reading the books has been enhanced by having watched the show, which is very much the reverse of how it usually is. For my quarantine corner, I want to get a reality check here from you, Ed, because I don't know if this is weird that I do this, uh, but I purchased MLB The Show, which is a video game. Obviously, it's a baseball video game, and you can play baseball on it, obviously, because it's a video game. I have not played a single game on this video game uh, even though, but like you can play it and like, they force you to play one as it's downloading or whatever. I've played that. But since then I have not played a single game. I like to sit there and manage the games and let them play out as they will. Cause you can manage like at by or plate appearance by plate appearance for the major league team, the triple a team, and the double a team. I do franchise okay. mode. I simulate every plate appearance one by one and see how things play out because I enjoy 
watching the development of the prospects. I enjoy looking at the, the statistics around it, seeing how my beloved Byron Buxton performs when I have no control <laughs> over him. And I like making the trades and things, but I hate playing the game. And I don't know if it's a waste of $60 to buy this game just to simulate things, which I could ostensibly just do on my computer. I could do the exact same thing. But I huh. get a lot of enjoyment out of watching these simulated plate appearances and seeing how things play out. I don't know if that's weird or not, though, but that, that's how I've been doing things, and it's weirdly addicting. Is this weird? No. I mean, I'm a sports analytics guy. Like, that's okay. not weird at all, right? I, mean, I hope you're not. Still, you're still getting uh, – I mean, you're getting the pleasure out of managing your team, mm -hmm. and then you don't want to actually play the game to go through every game. I mean, you're just simulating them out. So. Right. And part you know, of the I mean, thought process is that I suck. I am terrible at this game because I have no timing. Um, <laughs> like my coordination right. of trying to swing at a pitch is just hideous. So if right. I were to actually play as the Twins, they would basically be the Orioles of uh, <laughs> this year's <laughs> Orioles. I'd rather not condemn them to that. I, again, I want Byron Buxton's stats. Yeah, exactly. I, I want Byron's stats to be as good as possible. And that's not going to happen no. if I'm controlling him. Uh, but it's it's fun, and it like it fills my like my brain needs some stats to look at, and it fills right. that need without having actual games going on. It just I have to pay sixty bucks to do it. But to me, it's a worthwhile trade off. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, like in you know in these NFL rankings that I was talking about and covering the future. You know, there's a simulation every iteration that the thing goes through, right? So right. very similar to what you're doing. And, like, I get a kick out of seeing those final results and yeah. uh, comparing them with what we'll see. I mean, I mean, I know from the past that um, that these market rankings are, are pretty predictive. You know, yeah. maybe not right now before the NFL draft, but, sure. you know, you, you take these market win totals in, in uh, early September, and that's a, you know, it's a very powerful predictor. So sure. I, I think – Given what we talk about on the show, given that I do football analytics, yeah, there's, I, I think that's great. I mean, that okay. that's completely natural to me. I feel very validated, so I hope you know that this has been a good <laughs> conversation for me psychologically to know that I'm not some psychopath sitting out here simulating these games. They've got like simulated DFS sports now, like uh, baseball, simulated baseball on FanDuel. They're simulating the Masters starting tomorrow uh, <laughs> right, with like yeah. Happy Gilmore in it. Um, so. You can do that if you want. So if you are also into simulation, but also want to potentially win some free money, because uh, there's no entry fee, you just kind of do it for fun, you can check those yeah. out. But uh, for me, I got to get my fix via MLB The Show and Byron Buxton. That is all that we have for today here on the show. Ed, it sounds like you have a pretty fun podcast in the work over at uh, the Football Analy Analytics Show, though. Yeah, I mean, I had um, Benjamin Robinson on uh, this past week. He does Grinding the Mocks. It was a website that I talked about on the show last week. Uh, so definitely go check that out. And then, I mean, personally to me, the most exciting thing is these NFL pre-draft rankings, taking fan duels, win totals, backing out a rating and a rank for every team. Uh, you can get that by signing up for my free email newsletter over at um, thepowerrank.com. All righty, uh, thepowerrank.com, and find Ed on Twitter, at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. We have League of Legends podcasts uh, for this weekend already posted uh, with myself, Brandon Gadula, and Tom Vecchio. I am not giving analysis because I am terrible. They are smart, though, so listen to them. Uh, we have a UFC podcast coming up on Monday as well to preview the pretty big slate they have posted for UFC. I think it's 249 coming up next weekend. So make sure you subscribe uh, and just check out all the, the FanDuel podcasts on the FanDuel Podcast Network, including JJ Zach Reese's podcast, the Late Round Podcast. Thank you to JJ once again for swinging by and talking player props. Follow JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB. Also, a big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for keeping us on the air here as always. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. Hopefully all of you are staying uh, safe, healthy, happy through all these weird times. And hopefully we can have some tangible sports to talk with you uh, once again soon. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>